Hey everyone, this is Giordano from The Juice Media. Welcome back to The Juice Media Podcast, a companion to the Honest Government ad series. This is episode 18, a companion to our latest epic double-length Honest Government ad about the Kyoto carryover credits and Australia's international climate shitfuckery. Hello, I'm from the Australian Government with a big announcement. We're finally ready to look like we're taking stronger climate action. That's right. While other nations are announcing bigger cuts to their emissions, we're announcing that we'll no longer use our Kyoto carryover credits to meet our targets. And we'd appreciate everyone patting us on the dick for that. A collaboration between Scotty from Marketing, Johnny from Accounting and Tony from Cunting. Cringe has been our policy at climate summits for the past two decades. Which is why to understand how this is just the latest latest chapter of Cringe, we need to take a trip back in time. So let's go. Like many of you, I had a vague idea of our government's use of these carryover credits to offset its emission targets, but I never really understood how shameful the story was until I learned the full picture, which is when Simon Holmes of Court came on the podcast, episode 8, and explain the story in more detail. If you listen to episode eight of the podcast, you might recall that at the time I said, what the fuck, we've got to make an honest government ad about this so that more people know the story. And that's what I planned to do. Then of course, COVID happened and then the US election. So I had to put the script on hold in order to focus on those stories. But I'm glad that we've managed to round off the year with the video I plan to make in March, which is just so 2020. Whilst this story might be new to many of you, I just wanna make it clear that we're not breaking the story. Many brilliant scientists and journos have written about it in detail and you'll find links to some of those in the show notes or the video description. What's been missing however is a no bullshit explainer that brutally but accurately synthesizes the complexity of the story down to a nugget of shit fuckery that people can really get their head around. And that's what the honest government ads are so good at doing. Of course by brutally condensing two decades of international climate politics into a five minute video I had to gloss over many of the details of the story. And that's precisely where the Juice Media podcast comes in handy by acting as a companion to the video and allowing allowing us to unpack and cover some of the things that we couldn't fit into the actual Honest Government ad. And to help us unpack our latest HGA, I'm stoked to have as my guest today on the podcast, Richie Mosian. Richie is a director of the Climate and Energy Program at the Australia Institute, and prior to that worked for the government in the Department of Climate Change and the Department of Foreign Affairs. He was Australia's lead negotiator at the Doha and Poland Climate Summits before quitting that position and going on to help set up the Australia Youth Climate Coalition. I asked Richie to hold our hand as he walks us through the history History of the Kyoto carryover credits and Australia's role in international climate negotiations. So make yourself a cup of tea, go for a nice long walk and enjoy our chat. I'll catch you on the other end. Welcome to the Juice Media Podcast, Richie Mosian. Thank you. Good to be here. It's great to have you here. Um, so our last Honest Government ad, as you know, is about the Kyoto carryover credits. And this podcast is going to be dedicated to really unpacking that story. Before we get into that, I just want to say something because I think there's a tendency for a lot of people to, sort of sometimes to go, oh, this is just sort of some tangential conversation about, you know, geeky climate, the science stuff or whatever. So I just want to say um, this is not a tangential story. It's right. At, it goes right to the heart of um, it. Well, I would say I would just want to preface it by saying that, you know, the, the window for preventing irreversible catastrophic warming beyond 1.5 degrees, which is where we say bye bye to the reef amongst other things, is closing faster than most people realize. So there is a sense of urgency about this conversation, even though we're talking about technicalities. And I just want people to keep that in mind because uh, it goes right to the heart of the survival of humanity, or at least Australia's role in ensuring that survival. So with that, in, with that little preface in mind, we're going to delve into this uh, story of the Kyoto credits. And obviously, it's, it's a topic that you are intimately acquainted with. Uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you've worked for the Australian government as one of the lead negotiators uh, to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. You were part of the negotiating team at the Doha Climate Summit in 2012, and also the following one in Poland, after which you, you said Fuck the shit had left uh, <laughs> because you weren't happy about what you saw happening at these negotiations. So you've had an inside view into how the Australian government operates and behaves at these climate negotiations. Have I got that right? Is that? Yeah, it's solid. Uh, so I want to get, um, you know, into the details of the story in a second, but before we do that, because I don't want to, it's quite a complex story and I want to push people right into the deep end. Can you give us a sense of the bigger picture? What is the context, the top level messaging here, the story uh, to, to help us understand the story of the Kyoto credits and why we've just been banned from the latest climate summit? Mm. So Australia is a shirker bandit when it comes to the UN climate negotiations. It has been 
since the early days. Like the UNFCCC has been around since 1992 when it was first signed. Paul Keating didn't even go to the actual signing in, in Rio. Um, and that kind of started us off on the note of Australia, just always looking at how we could game the international system. And sometimes there'll be a, a strong prime minister and a strong performance, but that seems to be more the exception. The rule tends to be that Australia will go there and try and look at doing as little as possible, trying to game the system, and then to come back and claim a win for Australia doing what it usually does, which is selling a crap load of fossil fuels. Like that's what Australia does. Like in terms of like global Olympics for exporting pollution, carbon pollution, Australia's third in the world right after Russia and Saudi Arabia. So what Australia exports in terms of fossil fuels is far bigger than what Australia emits at home. And that's still big. Australia is the 14th largest emitter, but it's the third largest dealer in fossil fuels. And fossil fuels are the main source of greenhouse gas emissions when they consume. So Australia is always looking to game the international system because it doesn't want people to focus on what it actually does, which is supply the world with these pollution tools. Um, it wants people to focus on actually the domestic stuff and the, and the, the minutiae of the accounting details. And then within that, it tries to do as little as possible. So that's the big picture. If you look at the Paris Agreement in the last what, five years ago, the world came together and agreed on the latest climate agreement. And it was special because every country has taken on some obligation that they volunteered. Um, that didn't exist in the past. But what Australia took on was relatively weak about half of what the fair share is supposed to be. Um, it didn't take on anything beyond that. It pulled out of the climate finance agreement to help developing countries. Uh, and then even to meet that weak target, it wants to use these leftover carbon credits. And the size of these carbon credits is pretty big, um, almost the size of Australia's national annual greenhouse gas emissions domestically. So by trying to use these credits, they're shirking a lot of effort that they would have had to otherwise undertake over the next 10 years because the Paris Agreement goes from 2020 to 2030. So that's the period we want to focus on. It's called the critical decade. That's the real window for us to turn and bend things down to actually save the reef, to keep global warming something somewhat manageable. And so it's all the more important to focus on the short term because that's really where things are most critical. Okay, great. So, so, um, and I just want to highlight what you just said about the, the, this is the decade that needs to count. Like this is the one. And it, so we need to keep that in mind when we talk about Australia's behavior going into this decade, it should send chills down people's spine because like we are, our government is literally playing a very dangerous game. Um, okay. So with that in mind, obviously, and I also, I also want to say, obviously, our video focused on Australia, but other wealthy countries have also done their part to bog down climate negotiations. It's not like Australia is the only bad faith actor here, but our government has certainly distinguished itself probably as one of the biggest pricks in the pack at these events. Uh, and at the heart of that is the story of these Kyoto credits, which I think is a useful prism to understand Australia's overall international climate politics, because, which, as you said, hinges on this idea of ga how do we game the system. Uh, also, by necessity, our Honest Government ad was a very condensed account of the story. We had to gloss over many details. And believe it or not, when you start to unpack the story, it gets even fucking worse. So that's what we're going to be doing now. Um, for example, when we talked about the Australia clause, we showed a graph. I will show it now as well on the podcast showing how we managed to um, negotiate a higher emission baseline than we deserved. We didn't explain that, but there's a story behind that. So with that in mind, Richie, take us on a little journey back in time, filling in some of the gaps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> in which, uh, yeah, so fill in the gaps. Um, and let's start with this, the famous Kyoto Summit, unless you want to take us back further, but I thought that would be a good place to start. Let's take us back to 1997. Okay. So, um, in the years leading up to 97, so look, you had the Howard government, um, you had uh, Alexander Downer as the foreign minister, and they basically traveled around the world and complained that Australia needed a special treatment uh, when it came to addressing greenhouse gas emissions because of the nature of Australia's economy. So it needed to be treated like a, like, like, like a, you know, yeah, like a special needs case. Yeah. And that entailed a number of different things, but one was that Australia shouldn't actually have to reduce its emissions because it's so emissions intensive um, that basically even just lowering that emissions intensity, mm -hmm. even just reducing a bit is hard for Australia. Therefore, it shouldn't have to do that much. So that was the first thing that they always argued, right? And that really came to a head in 97, at the end of 97, when everyone met in Kyoto. And so when 
the way Kyoto, the Kyoto Protocol worked is it was top down. You had to sit around a table and all the, the developed countries, and it's defined developed countries as of sort of 1990, 1992. So these were like the developed countries 30 years ago. It didn't include countries like, say, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, which seems a bit odd now, but that's how it was back then. So there's only like maybe two dozen countries all sat around the table, and then they had to negotiate and agree on what their targets were going to be. This is different to the Paris Agreement, which is bottom up. This one is kind of negotiating the consensus. And so Australia was just lobbying, 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 lobbying. And then it felt like it had some traction because it managed to negotiate an increase, which is the 108% over the period 2008 to 2012, right? Only two other countries got an increase. Uh, Norway got about a 1% increase, I think, or 2%, Iceland. Um, and if we remember, Norway is a massive oil exporter. And Iceland is a pretty small country. It's about what the size of Tasmania, I think, in terms of population. But it wanted to go heavy into aluminium smelting. And so it was going to move into heavy polluting industries. And so they're just like, fine, whatever. Just to keep you three happy, uh, we'll just accept the fact. Because it's more important to get everyone involved than it is just to be purist about this. And we want to nail this. And, and the, then, and the time, sorry, yeah. and the time frame, just yeah. so people get that, is the this is nineteen ninety seven, but they're talking about uh, the the these these targets are in twenty twelve, so it's for a period yeah. from twenty uh, two thousand eight to two thousand and twelve. Twenty twelve, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's the that's the period yeah. that we're talking about. Okay. Exactly. So they're negotiating for emissions reductions in eleven years. Yeah. You know, eleven to fifteen years away. Yeah. And still, Australia was negotiating to have the emissions increase then. Yeah. Right. Um, and Australia got it. It got it, and it got it well before the last sort of closing session. It was pretty good for Australia in the way that they saw it. This was Robert Hill, who was the environment minister, who was there repping. But then the real kind of shirker move was at last minute. The negotiations are going way over time. They always do. And then that's when Australia said, but we want our baseline to be elevated by taking into account the land clearing. Um, basically how you account for land use or what's known as land use, land use change in forestry, LULUCF, right? And that's important because before 1990, Australia was just clearing a crap load, right? So they're just demolishing forest and bush here and there everywhere. Sorry, 1990 is the baseline year, just so that people uh, yes. who are unfamiliar with this. So the reason you mentioned that year is because Kyoto said we're going to count Although we're in 1997, we're talking about targets in 2012, the baseline that when you say 108% or 1%, it's in reference to yeah. emissions in 1990. Sorry, I just wanted to make that point. Exactly. No, no, it's, it's, it's super important. And you know, when we, when we wonk out, we often forget that we need to explain <laughs> the basis. But you're right. Everyone, everyone had to agree on the starting point. The starting point was going to be 1990. But how you accounted for the emissions in 1990 was still in question. Sure. And within that, Australia knew because it, it commissioned – um, ABES, which is the Australian Bureau of, of Agriculture um, Studies, what it did find is if you included land use, um, because Australia cleared lots of land before 1990, but then changed some of the state rules so that that number dropped significantly after 1990, it meant that you started with an elevated baseline. Yeah, when things were really bad. It's like, it's like basically saying, I'm going to lose weight, and you start from when you were fattest, right? Even though you've already lost like 10 kilos. Yeah basically the same kind of thing. Um, so it allows you to be the biggest loser very easily. And that's what Australia did. And and no one else had a similar situation to Australia. And so when they held things up last minute, it was mainly because they were going to benefit from it, which is why it's pretty much known commonly as the Australia Clause. When you say last minute, I mean, this is literally like 2 a.m. in the morning. Like everyone was yeah, exhausted. Yeah, totally. it was like, and so we pulled this absolute dick move. Which was obviously all the people there would have gone, okay, okay, you know, this is, I mean, probably they didn't think it was a good idea, but the the, the real sort of the sneaky part of it is uh, we'll put this graph up again so people can see it. It's the graph that we use in the video. You get that high baseline, but then you've got this dip in uh, in the emissions that comes down before it goes up again. And that's the crucial thing. We knew that our emissions actually dropped drastically due to uh, land clearing emissions dropped drastically. So we knew that it wasn't a realistic baseline. And when you take that chunk of the, the land clearing emissions out, and we even show it in the video, we have a little arrow, actually our emissions um, went up rather than down, which is crucial for understanding the credits uh, genesis story. Show us what yeah, have you got to there. Get, to get, this is the original Kyoto Protocol wow. from the UNFCCC, and then this is the Australia Clause right here. Wow! Like, it. so it's it's a uh, yeah, yep. Article three seven, three point right. seven, the, the Australia Clause. 
hopefully kids will learn about this stuff in school um you know one day and you know this it'll be kind of not not a proud uh, chapter of our history but anyway so but we haven't finished it with Kyoto. It it, it, get, it gets worse. Right? No, no, it get, it gets worse, right? And so, like, and part of this was because they wanted to incentivize people taking as much emissions reduction. They didn't want you to wait fifteen years to really start doing the heavy lifting. So they said, if you do more than what we've agreed on, you can carry that forward, right? Mm-hmm. You get extra credit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that worked well if if the Kyoto was going to be run over a number of periods. And so that was also baked into the original protocol, so which, which made sense back then, right? You want to incentivize early action, so you allow people to take credit yep. for early action. So with those three things then led to the current situation we're in now, but of course, there's a few iterations in between. Are we jumping to 2012? Yes. So yes, uh, but, but hang on. But after all of that, yep. yes, John Howard didn't, didn't, I mean, I find that's the, the, the like, as if, as if it wasn't that bad enough. Yes, the motherfucker then didn't ratify the Kyoto Protocol for an entire decade. He was like, "We got everything that we wanted." Everyone was like, "Okay, fine, you, you, you know, pieces of shit." Okay, fine, put the Australia clause in there, and then we didn't, we didn't ratify it. How, how did that? Can you just before we finish this yeah. sordid chapter? How did that uh, unfold? Yeah, I mean, part of it was also the influence of Bush, um, yeah, Bush Junior. So right. yeah. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so like, even though Robert Hill had negotiated a great deal, according to him, he went back to Canberra. Everyone's like, ah, good job, Rob. Um, and then suddenly he went to go ahead and try and start pushing it through cabinet and he started getting pushback. Even then, um, there was sort of a, already a vanguard move to distance ourselves. And then when it looked clear that George Bush um, was going to be elected and then the US basically, because what also happened is that Al Gore helped negotiate the Kyoto Protocol. And he went back to the U.S. and he struggled to get their Senate to actually adopt and ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And then what's worse, and then George Bush came into power as well, right? So you had the Republican movement in the U.S. that then started pushing back on climate action. And Australia, like, like, uh, like it often does, takes its cues on recalcitrance from the United States. Right. And that, I think, helped influence um, Howard to not, ratify the Kyoto Protocol. I mean, the irony, right, though, is that Australia still took efforts to reduce its emissions in line with 108%. So even though it hadn't ratified, its policy within government was, but we will still meet our targets, Mm -hmm. right? Just like, because it had gained such a good situation itself, it was still like, okay, so internally, there was still work done to try and do what we could to limit limit it where possible. Not, not, you know, it's, as you know, emissions still massively increased. Yeah. But... Um, but there was this kind of weird kind of like, let's try if we can. Okay. Gotcha. Um, okay. Let's move forward to, um, 2012. So 2012, yep. as, 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 as you said, Richie is the, is the point it's the end target now is where all the countries go. Okay. Let's see how we performed against what we made in promises. Uh, and this is also the, the, the chapter, which is the genesis of these, um, infamous Kyoto carryover credits. So yeah, take yeah. us through that chapter. All right. So now you have a labor government. Uh, in 2012, um, and you know, and it's a Labour government that's actually taking action on climate change, right? So you have a carbon price that's coming into force, and you know, postscript, even though it hasn't lasted more than two years, it did work. The carbon price actually reduced Australia's emissions by two percent over the the two years it was operating, and it grew our economy over five percent. So the the sky didn't fall in, emissions went down, carbon price worked. This was the period that Australia was part of th- that scene. Um, a new round of Kyoto negotiations were taking place because the 2012 period had ended and then they were looking at 2013 to 2020. That was the second round of the Kyoto Protocol. At the same time, they're also looking at a new, potentially a new climate treaty. So the thought was there that, oh, well, we might have a new climate treaty altogether, but we still need to try and incentivize action in the short term. And so this is where Australia said, okay, well, since we've done, we haven't done horribly, we're still able to meet and beat our target. We will stay potentially in the same treaty we will take on another target for that next period but it won't be very ambitious and we insist that we need to carry over our achievement from the first period and so that's what they did and because everyone was desperate to try and keep as many people as they could into kyoto because some countries they were just total banded so like even though canada for example had negotiated like uh, an ambitious target under the first round of the kyoto protocol it went to the the cop in 2012 i believe um, and then as soon as it la- went back home to Canada, the minister, she, they pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol altogether. 
So like there's some, there was some serious jiggery pokery there as well from others. So it's not like, so everyone was trying to keep Australia in the tent. And so that's why they, they again agreed to Australia taking on a weak target and again agreed to carrying over um, these credits from the first round. And so Australia's target, if you use a, um, so Australia's target was about 5% from a 2000 baseline, but from a 1990 baseline, it was like 0.5%. Right. Yeah. So the basic this was yeah. very little. Yeah. yeah. Very little. Fuck all, basically. I believe. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And so once again, it kind of got away with that as well. Yeah. Right. And the, but the credits themselves come in, so although they're not being used yet because um, technically they only come into into uh, into action later on. They were born from the fact that by having had a higher baseline, um, we got to much more easily achieve come in under our target. So we had a bullshit mm -hmm. target, which we negotiated, as you said, yeah. which was super yeah. high, 180%. Uh, and then we came under that. That's how the, these Kyoto carryover credits were created. Um, exactly. So we just have to park that in our mind because then now we, as we move forward um, into the next chapter, which would you say would be the, par I mean, would you, I mean, in yeah. the video, yeah. we yeah. jumped to Paris, but if you want to take other stops along the, the line, go for it. <laughs> oh, I mean, like, I mean, like, it's really important to mark that, you know, 2013 then kind of went really went pear shaped for Australia yeah. because you had Tony Abbott voted in, right? Um, and then you had, um, you know, like the scrapping of the carbon price in an attempt to try and claw back the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, the Renewable Energy Agency, the Renewable Energy Target. They basically tried to demolish the entire center. So it was bad days. And then on top of that, once they did get rid of the carbon price, Australia basically, their national emissions went up and they kept going up like for about five years after that. So Australia was, was in a worse place when Abbott came in and just basically wrecked the joint. Okay, so, yeah, gotcha. so that's kind of like the interceding years until you get to Paris. I think another important thing to mention here, just to add into the story, 2007, when Labor was voted in, the first thing that Kevin Rudd did was to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So that... Um, yeah. That was uh, officially happened when government changed. Uh, he then he tried to introduce climate legislation, uh, which was um, uh, didn't didn't succeed in getting through. Then Gillard came in, formed a coalition with the Greens, and they passed a much better climate policy. I think, we, we, you know, um, most people would agree. And as you said, we actually started making some progress, but that was short lived because Tony came in and burnt it all to the fucking ground. All right, but that's really uh, important domestically. Yeah, but good, take good, us back. Good, to good, 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 good. <laughs> Uh, take us back to the international uh, yeah, setting the now international to Paris place. in 2015. Right. So, so we're at Paris, um, yeah, and the whole world is joined. Now, remember, in 2009, the world tried to come together to, to negotiate a new climate treaty, right? And it failed. Like that's when Rudd got really furious, and you know everything kind of went. This is the there. Copenhagen. Yeah. This is the Copenhagen. Exactly. Summit, right. The, the Copenhagen COP. Um, and so this was the next, Paris was like the final stand. This was the opportunity to sort of save things internationally. And it's hard. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change works by consensus. Um, so every single country has to agree on every single word in the entire package for there to, for there to be progress. So it's, it's a tough gig mm -hmm. and that's why it's slow and incremental and it's a bit of a grind. But when it works, it works. And that's what the Paris Agreement was. It was an example of when it works. And so everyone came together and they said, we're starting again. We're going to have a new treaty, a new approach to climate change. Everyone's going to volunteer what they need to do in terms of their nationally determined contributions, their NDCs. Um, so we're not going to tell them what to do. They, they know what to do. But it should ideally add up to a pathway that keeps us from dangerous climate change. And that's ideally 1.5 degrees, no more than 2 degrees maximum. That's, that's what the Paris Agreement did. And because we're starting again, we should voluntarily cancel all these dodgy ass credits, right? And so they actually, in the decision they agreed at Paris, not in the treaty, but in the decision that kind of put it into effect, they actually have one of the clauses in there. It says, I think clause 108 um, of 1CP21, if you want to look it up, those playing at home, <laughs> uh, it basically says that you should voluntarily cancel your leftover carbon credits from uh, the Kyoto Protocol. So it, it's actually basically in there into that language recommending it. And so the UK, and Sweden and the Netherlands and Denmark and Germany did that. They got up on stage at Paris and they said, yeah, we'll cancel them because they're not in the spirit of the Paris Agreement. We should be starting from, from scratch and we should reduce how much is going forward rather than using these dodge credits we accrued from the past. Um, but Australia didn't. <laughs>
so now we're getting into sort of present tense because we started hearing about i started hearing you, you you i'm sure you've heard about them since a lot earlier but they kind of became the, the australian government kind of went public with this uh part of its pr marketing strategy in terms of talking about these credits and it used them as a um as a way of saying this is how we how we're going to meet our meet and beat our climate targets we started hearing this um rhetoric 2018 or something so yeah 2018 and, that, yeah. and that's after malcolm turnbull um lost uh, uh yeah. sort of turfed himself uh, on the back of yeah. trying to so if we just t t take a step back into domestic policy malcolm turnbull leading the, the the coalition government was trying to introduce a national energy guarantee the neg which was widely criticized both from the, the conservative side of the coalition government and also from climate mm. activists both sides you know for different reasons didn't like it and and sorry to, to summarize the story very shortly malcolm turnbull was basically turfed off off the back of that and then we have scott morrison how did these credits start to then appear into the discourse yeah. So I think the big difference between Prime Minister Scott Morrison and former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull is former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull actually wants to do something about climate change. Whether he's effective at doing that or not, you know, history, you know, is, is a good indicator. But at least he was, you know, giving it a go. And the NEG was the latest iteration of that. Prime Minister Scott Morrison, though, has no illusions as to the need to address climate change and will look to do the bare minimum. And we'll see it through the lens of, how can I pacify the loudest voices in my political party room um, or coalition party room? And so through that lens, he's like, well, what is the easiest way to do this? The easiest way is looking for the get out of jail free card. And we've got these credits. Let's use them. We earned them. So let's use them um, because we're good at reducing emissions and we meet and beat slash cheat. And so therefore, we're going to go ahead and we're going to use these credits. And so in the 2018 emissions projection, suddenly... Australia is now using a good chunk of these credits. It was like about 367 million tons of credits. That's a lot. That's like two thirds of Australia's annual emissions reduction. It's like the entire emissions. Pacific nation's emissions. Uh, something isn't that, is that a comparison yeah, yeah. at some point? Yeah, exactly. So, like you know, the entire Pacific's fossil fuel emissions is like about 40, 45 million tons. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's you know a, a good like like six, seven times more times that yeah right maybe even eight yeah so it is a lot like about eight times almost the pacific's emissions right it's a real like shirker move which is why um, when and scott morrison turned up at the pacific forum people were in tears they were like yeah, just to put it in perspective it's like we are like this giant uh sort of neighbor that is absolutely um you know th threatening the survival of these are going to be some of the earliest impacted not that yeah. australia isn't itself on the front line of, of climate emergency but, sure, but, but it's a wealthy country sure. yeah exactly um so just that's why you know people were in tears like the leaders of some of these uh pacific nations were literally uh, in tears when they were trying to convince yeah. scott morrison not to use these credits yeah and i mean and these leaders are saying just can you can you just not cheat like yeah. just not cheat like like it's not, we're not even asking you to do something yeah. like ambitious just mm. don't be a bandit like that's mm. it's that mm. simple um so yeah and so it, it it cropped up in the 2018 emissions projections and so suddenly like and this is because as i said five years of rising emissions right and and because they have no policies they had like the emissions reduction fund which is basically paying polluters to maybe reduce a little bit less wasn't getting anywhere close to the emissions reductions we needed. There's this thing called the safeguards mechanism. It was supposed to cap the most polluting things in Australia, the most polluting facilities. It wasn't working. A good example of that, right, is there's this one site in, in the northwest of Western Australia. It's called the Gorgon um, Gas Field and, and Gas Facility. Um, it was supposed to bury its emissions, right, Carb through carbon capture and storage. It didn't. For three years, it didn't. It just polluted them straight up into the air. Right. And and it basically doubled the, the increase in national greenhouse gas emissions. It was that big. Right. Like so all these companies were getting away with polluting, like nothing was really stopping them. The federal government wasn't interested in stopping them. And so they so they reached for these credits. They said, great, here's a get out of jail free card. Um, we're going to use that. And so then it cropped up in their emissions projections. And suddenly it became a very clear policy decision for the federal government to rely on these credits to meet their target. And by relying on them, they don't have to reduce emissions. That's the real benefit for them. And then in 2019, um, at the last UN climate conference, which was in Madrid in December, this time last year, uh, there was a move by a number of smaller countries, some of these small and developing states in the Pacific and in the Caribbean, um, to actually make a rule in the rule book for how you implement the Paris Agreement that actually said you can't use these credits. And that's where Australia started getting into trouble. And then that's when it realized 
oh, wow, we don't really have any friends. No one else is trying to shirk things as badly as we are. Um, and then and then they realized that like they'd have to lobby hard against it. That entire negotiation fell over. So they were moving the negotiations to this year. Unfortunately, there is no UN climate conference this year, but it basically did out Australia and got them into some serious, some serious, um, serious trouble. And were those UN climate negotiations to continue, that would have only continued. So Australia was feeling that international pressure and it was becoming more and more clearer locally, right? And we were talking about like how once you explain this whole drama around the Kyoto credits, it really is um, quite simple to like find funny analogies for it, but you need to get your head around it. And so like when you can have like the host of the Bachelor TV show get up on stage and say, oh, I told my second wife I don't need to wash any more dishes because I washed a whole bunch when I was with my first wife and use that to like write real off the Kyoto credits line, it, mm -hmm. then you know that you're kind of moving it into the, the main space and people are, are getting their heads around what this is. And as soon as they realize it is just a form of cheating, then it becomes a lot harder for the government to defend it. Okay. And when you say form of cheating, I think specifically it's in relation, okay, apart from the fact that we didn't really deserve these credits, but we got them. So you could say, okay, well, technically we, we earned them, although it was very kind of shameful way of doing it with the Australia clause and all that. Um, but then um, technically there is no legal mechanism. Like there's no, exactly. it's not even, I mean, there's no other country that's trying to use these credits. Is that correct? We're the only ones correct. and there isn't even a legal mechanism for doing it. So it's like, it's yeah. absurd. I mean, it, it, yeah, cheating, it, is, it, cheating is the only way that you could do it. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's no legal basis. There's nothing in the Paris Agreement that allows for the importation of these credits. So there's nothing in the legal frameworks for either Kyoto or Paris. Like it's not a, it's not a successor of the Kyoto Protocol. Mm. There's nothing in the Paris Agreement that says you can use these credits. So they're legally baseless. And then even this year, early this year, nine law professors from different sandstone universities across Australia came out and said, there's no basis under law for this. So how can you be running this argument internationally? You're just damaging our collective like credibility as a country to address this issue. So just to finish up the story, um, bring us back into the present. Now that we have really unpacked in, and in, the in world detail. is on fire. Yeah, well, actually, well, it's good to also, can we, yeah. actually, just as a context, it's really important because whilst we've been talking about all, all this, whoops, from uh, 19, 1990 to 2020, it's not like just things have been the same. We've had this uh, incredible deterioration and alarming escalation of the climate uh, crisis, um, which puts into perspective how absurd uh, our governments, how dangerous our government's approach to, to this policy is. Um, so maybe you, if you could speak about that and then also about... Um, if you could just bring us into the present with uh, the latest development of the story, which is the government saying, we're not going to use these credits and then being disinvited or not allowed to speak at the latest climate summit. Mm -hmm. Why, yeah, why latest is that? Episode. Yes. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Like things haven't stayed static over the last 30 years. Um, you know, the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO put out the latest state of the climate in Australia that shows that, you know, since 20, since 1910, since we started taking records are pretty much like, pre-industrialized as close as you can get in Australia that the global the average temperature in Australia has increased 1.44 degrees Celsius so if you put that like it just even if you just connect that to our desire to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees and that the average warming in Australia is 1.44 like they're not directly comparable but it just gives you just a feel for how badly we've gone over the last 30 years and Australia is a, you know, in line for more bushfires, you know, more floods, you know, more intense cyclones, more sea level rise, more coral bleaching, like all the things, like all the vulnerabilities are right here. Um, and Australia's in the front line, but at the same time, we're also one of the wealthiest countries. What's worse is those Pacific Island countries, the small and developing states where this is an existential crisis, like the islands will go under or they will become uninhabitable. Um, and so for those guys who don't have the wealth, who do not have like the land space, um, yeah, like they're, they're at wit's end. Um, and so that's probably a good fast forward for where we're at now. Um, because we don't have a UN climate conference at the end of this year, like is originally planned, the host for that conference was gonna be the UK. So the UK and the UN Secretary General and France who hosted the, 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 the Paris Climate Summit five years ago, all came together and said, well, let's have a climate ambition summit. So it'll be online on Zoom. We'll invite countries and we'll give them specific criteria. So you've got to either increase your target for 2030. You either have to come up with a long-term climate strategy like the 2050, um, or you have to give a serious amount of 
of foreign aid to developing countries to help them with their climate plans, or you need to take some serious action to build your own adaptation and resilience to climate impacts. Australia was like, yeah, we'd love to speak, and then didn't tick anything, right? And then, and then Prime Minister Scott Morrison was like, you know, during Parliament when he was asked a question by uh, Adam Bant, the Greens member for Melbourne, he's like, yeah. oh, yeah, I'm going to go and I'm going to speak, and, uh, and I'm going to correct some mistruths. That's what he said, right? And he was thinking, oh, well, my mate Boris Johnson's organizing it. He's a conservative like me. You know, they, we're trying to negotiate a free trade agreement, and they're, Jesus knows they're looking for friends because they pissed off all their other ones in Europe. I'm sure I'll get an invite. He didn't, right? Because Boris Johnson put climate above Scott Morrison, and he has some integrity because it's popular in the UK to actually show leadership on climate change. And of course, France is the same, and the UN Secretary General is the same. The UN Secretary General is telling countries no more coal. No more coal power, no more coal mines, right? And that developed countries like Australia should phase out of coal in 10 years. So he's just right out there in the front. Um, and so Scott Morrison wasn't invited. And then last week was like, oh, well, uh, I, I didn't even want to go anyway. You know, like <laughs> who needs to go to these summits? You know, like is it, you know, like, it's like the kid who didn't, you know, get invited yeah. to the cool kid party. He's like, I, I never wanted to go. I'm busy, yeah. you know, playing magic cards. So, uh, yeah, I'm good. But also and, on, on yeah. top of that, he said, we're not going to use his credits, which I think he expected to receive some praise for. But if you can put that in perspective for us. Exactly. So uh, so, so a day or two after he said he was going to speak at this, then a story comes out in the Sydney Morning Herald. It's basically front page, Australia abandoning Kyoto credits plan. And part of that was because the way that um, emissions projections have gone recently is that electricity, which is the majority of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions, about a third of our national emissions, have been doing quite well in terms of going down despite the federal government. So all the coalition governments at state government level, New South Wales, South Australia, Tasmania, are all doing amazing things in renewables. So are Victoria, Queensland, um, and, and of course the ACT is already 100% renewable. So like all these states were moving and that was massively helping to reduce the emissions. And then the pandemic reduced our transport emissions, the drought reduced our agricultural emissions. So suddenly we were going like this way with our emissions and it's going a bit more like this. And then he realized, well, if I can kind of play with the numbers in this bit here, we might not need to use them, which is great because that's a political liability. So let's get rid of that um, and thought that would be good enough. And it wasn't. And so then he's like, oh, well, I'll just tell my friends in the Pacific that because they've asked me not to use these. Australia gets a speaking slot of the Pacific Forum because we're a member. So it's by default, not by merit. And he went there and his speech was, it was, it was terrible. It, it fell flat. Like you have Pacific Islands saying, you know, like, yeah, you know, like we had cyclones that wiped out the entire GDP of our country. And he's like, oh, let me tell you about the technology roadmap. We're going to be getting hydrogen down to two bucks. And this, like, like a sales pitch. Um, and then he tried to use his Kyoto credits line. And even then he didn't say we're going to cancel them. Right. He just said we're not going to use them. Right. And, that, and there's, there's, a, there's a proper difference between the two. Right. He's not even willing to say, cause that's, what, that's what New Zealand said. We're going to cancel our credits. And he said, oh, well, we will, we're confident that we don't have to use them. Right. That's kind of legally, legal kind of loophole there. Even, even then, uh, uh, we haven't been able to take, like, even though technically all this is is a promise not to cheat, which is already just pathetic in itself, we haven't really even promised that. We're just like, we'll try. We'll try not to cheat. Is that, I mean, yeah, it kind of does my thing. Well, we're pretty confident we won't have to cheat. Yeah. So that's good news, right? You're yeah. like, yeah, I imagine like your partner telling you, oh, you want a bit of romance this week? I will not cheat on you. I'm pretty confident I won't cheat on you. <laughs> what like, a man. Like, yeah. yeah, it's like, ooh, tell me more. Okay, so thanks so much for taking us through that, uh, Richie. I want to ask you, um, just by way of kind of taking us uh, towards the conclusion, what um, is the next piece of shit fuckery from the, the the coalition government that we need to watch out for? We we know that there's always something else coming up. We we've been hearing a lot about the so-called gas-led recovery. Uh, if that's even a thing, is it just a marketing slogan? Is there is there an actual recovery? And also about the tech investment roadmap. Um, yep, these are some of the things that the government is now proposing as a, as its solution in lieu of actually. Um, reducing emissions. But are these actually solutions? I suppose, let me ask, ask an open question. Are these actually yep. solutions or is it yeah. more bullshit? Yeah. Uh, the solu yeah. The answer is no, they're not, right? So a gas-led recovery is, is just, it's just marketing, right? Gas, which is often referred to as natural gas, really should be referred to as fossil gas, right? And it can be as bad as coal in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and right now, Australia is the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas in the world, um, followed closely by Qatar. Uh, 
Australia has tripled its gas supply in the last through 10 years on the east coast of Australia. So Australia has just massively ramped up. So despite everything that's going on in the UNFCCC and the UN climate, Australia has been trying to sell fossil fuels like they're going out of, you know, out of fashion because they are. And so it's been massively ramping it up. Has this led to cheaper domestic gas prices for Australia? No, it's actually gone up. So even the supply has massively gone up, the price has also gone up. Why? Because all of it's been exported overseas. Um, gas can be as bad as coal. It's bad for the climate. It's also bad for jobs. Um, so most people think that there's a lot of jobs in the mining industry, especially in coal and gas, but there isn't. They get that number wrong by a factor of like 40 or 50. Um, in fact, investing in the gas sector is the worst sector you can invest in for job creation because it's so capital intensive. Also, the federal government doesn't make much money from gas. So for example... The Commonwealth government only made a little bit over a billion dollars from gas um, the last time we looked. Qatar, by example, makes over $26 billion for the same amount of gas that it exports. Right? So, it was, so we don't tax it enough. We don't tax it anywhere close to enough. They so we don't even get the benefits it. of it. Like no, the, the we don't get the money. There's, hmm. there's hardly any jobs. In the last year, there were 38,000 people who worked in the gas and oil exploration sector. According to the ABS, it's now 18,000. So they shed their jobs quickly as well. Most of these gas projects have been shelved. Like gas is just a terrible sector. And also like the science is dodged around it. The only reason we're talking about a gas fired recovery is because Prime Minister Scott Morrison appointed a gas executive to lead the pandemic recovery, right, in the form of Nev Power. And then he appointed another gas executive to review Australia's entire climate policy suite, right, in the form of Grant King. Like so gas is very successful in marketing and in getting, you know, positions of power and influence, but not in terms of actual job creation, not in terms of income, and not in terms of climate. And just to add even one like insult to injury, although we, even though like on top of the fact that it doesn't actually benefit, like it no, doesn't lower energy bills, it doesn't create jobs um, and all of these things, it also cancels out all of the good things that people are trying to do. Because like, for example, we've had like 2.5 million solar uh, people have put, um, how, homes have put solar panels on, on their roofs. That's like, that's an amazing show of individual yeah. like you know we want yeah. to do so well that's all completely cancelled out by the emissions of the shell chevron gorgon project yeah. in wa exactly exactly then, you, then you've got people who are like i'm not going to fly you know i'm going to like i'll skip that conference i'll do it via zoom that's all completely uh out of the window when you take because all of the aviation emissions for an entire year are equivalent to the emissions from the vales point uh, coal power plant so it's excruciatingly uh rage inducing um that you know that this is that is going ahead the government is literally uh it's a massive fuck you to all the people who really care uh, about climate who are, who are trying their best to take individual action um but exactly. unless you take collective action uh which is uh, i suppose electoral action like you know at the next election these things it's good man i don't want to say put solar panels up you know be vegan um don't, don't uh, drive you know or don't fly or you know do all of those things mm. but it's mm. it's it's such a waste of goodwill if we don't get political action because those things aren't nearly enough uh, is that a fair sort of approach like do you uh, it, it's bang on and look, the most successful thing that governments have done is to tell you that you're the problem and you need to change what you need to do do those things but they are secondary to actually holding the government to account and holding corporations to account because that is where the majority of our greenhouse gas emissions are. And unless we're doing that kind of action, then we are, we are in a world of pain when it comes to climate change. So like do the research into which organizations you want to support that are politically active, but get politically active because climate change is a political issue, whether we want it to be or not. And so you need to be political about how you engage climate action not just in terms of how you consume and it's so important like it reminds me of like when they first came up with with road rules like when when automobiles were first designed and were taken to the road right there, there was a big debate about who where the honors should be placed is the honors placed on car drivers or is the honors placed on pedestrians and they put it on pedestrians that was lobbying from the car industry saying yeah. no people should watch out for cars and yeah. it's on them to not jaywalk and let's make that a crime right <laughs> the same thing like yeah. corporations are responsible for emissions and we need to hold them to account and it's not you and your keep cup that's going to save the world it'll definitely help but it's holding these companies to account because if chevron get away with pumping millions of tons of emissions in the air it doesn't matter how many flights you avoid mm -hmm.
you feel like this moment in history, are you hopeful that we finally reached a turning point um, with the way the international climate negotiations are going? Do you see this as the moment that it's going to, is this the year potentially that we really, that humanity really rises to this challenge? Or are you skeptical? A little bit like Greta is, uh, you know, everyone is at the moment celebrating the fifth anniversary of the Paris, Paris Accord and she poured water on the parade saying, quote, our leaders present their hopeful distant hypothetical targets, net zero loopholes and empty promises. Um, do you w w sort of, where do you, where do you stand? Where do you see us um, being at this moment in history? Uh, I am hopeful and I've become more hopeful in the last few months. And there's three reasons why. The first is international pressure seems to be working in bringing laggards like Australia forward. And that's in the context of the Kyoto credits, but we're also seeing it more broadly in actually having to front up to these summits and look and, and try and get in and, and want to be seen to be taking action. And that has an impact and that pressure comes from internationally, but also comes from the ground up. And we're seeing that increase. The second is the fact that the majority of Australia's coal and the majority of Australia's gas go to three countries, China, South Korea, and Japan. All three have taken on net zero targets. Now, yes, they're far away and yes, they're not good enough, but there's basically a signal to the market that we are gonna get our coal and gas imports down to zero. And we're going to do so in the next decade or two. So whether you like it or not, if you're a major fossil fuel exporter like Australia, you better beware, right? But and, sorry, and, this, yeah. this word net zero, can I just check? Like, yeah, sure. What is that? Is that a loophole? Is that another legal marketing accounting trick? Or it, 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 It's gray language that you use uh, in diplomacy in order to get everyone across the line. And it can be, we're going to get to zero emissions. It could be as good as that, or it could be, we'll get to as low as we possibly can until it becomes extremely expensive. And then we will pay for offsets or come into some, you know, like technologies that draw down carbon. And then we'll use that to offset what we can't avoid emitting. That's what net zero basically means. Okay, but right. basically, but in terms of fossil fuels, though, it will mean that we will, we will massively reduce our fossil fuels, okay. especially coal. So that, that, that's what that means on that front. And so, that with, so whether you want that change to happen or not, it's coming. And if Australia keeps pissing China off, then that'll happen even sooner, right? Yep. And the third one is just the largest projects in this country. They used to be oil refineries. They used to be gas fields. They used to be coal mines right? Like my, my, my parents emigrated to Australia to work on, you know, on an oil refinery. Like those, those were the major, the major sort of developments that our country held on to. Now the largest projects are solar fields and wind farms. Like there's one in the Northwest of Australia that is eight times the size of Canberra, right? And they're going to be shipping clean energy to the world. So like, that's what gives me hope. Like the, those things are happening. Um, and coal is no longer the flavor of choice. Like well, that's, that's why we're talking about gas. That's why we talked about gas before. And, and we're seeing that evolution come both in, in the business space, in the economic space and in the diplomatic space. So that's what gives me hope. That's really good to hear. And um, I suppose also, um, you know, we're coming up to a federal election. So as we said, like, yes, people can take individual action. It's good that you put solar panels up. It's good that, you know, you change your diet or your lifestyle, maybe take one less flight. But when the next federal election comes, vote for a candidate that is going to take serious climate action because we have to get this carbon mafia i mean literally the behavior that we've discussed in our video and that you've really unpacked is absolutely embarrassing and one of the reasons we made this video was really just to get people to understand and you've been really trying to get this message out and i guess that our video is trying to help to amplify that how embarrassing this is for all australians what our government has been doing in our name exactly right and you know it's it's christmas is around the corner talk to people about climate change. Don't feel like you can't talk about it because it's a political issue or because you don't know enough. You know enough, talk about it. There's massive polluters. They're getting away without, without paying anything for carbon pollution. Talk about it. Great, I can't stop talking about it. So I, I, I take the opposite <laughs> advice and shut up and let, give people a break over Christmas. But no, keep going, it's keep really making good. more videos to your donor. Keep, keep at it. The Juice is doing an excellent job and you're doing a great job.
Thank you very much. Like one of the things we're going to do next year is really focus more on climate stuff because there's so much other shit fuckery, the technology roadmap, carbon storage. We want to try and sort of unpack the stuff so that people understand it. And thank you, Richie. And, uh, and uh, you know, all the work that you do at the Australia Institute, really all the reports that are published there, I've used them a lot for writing the Honest Government ads. We used them for, for, for the last one about the, the, um, the, the, the tax cuts. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you for all the work that yeah, you're doing. Thank and, you. Uh, and uh, much, like, much like the juice that the Australia Institute operates, thanks to people like donating so like so like you know thank you we've got a great team here from richard dennis to a, a whole bunch of great climate researchers here so yeah so support organizations that do good work on the things you care about like like the juice great we'll put a link to uh your page uh, uh in the in the show notes thank you so much for joining us richie really appreciate it thank you richard bye-bye thank you Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Juice Media Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this journey into another chapter of Australia's climate history. As always, if you found it helpful, please recommend our podcast to friends and family so we can spread the word. That way, hopefully more people can make informed decisions at the next federal election. I also want to give a shout out to our small but dedicated team for their hard work on this epic HGA. Not only did it take longer to film it because of the length, but then the day after we finished filming, the Morrison government announced that it wouldn't be using its carryover credits after all, which meant that I had to go back and rewrite the introduction and conclusion. Huge props to Ellen, Zoe and Lucy for being such troopers and cancelling their plans so we could come back and reshoot half the video at short notice. But most importantly, thank you to the three and a half thousand legends who support us with a contribution each month on Patreon, especially our Patreon producers who support us at the highest contribution tier of $100 a month. Thank you. Our patrons are the reason that we can continue to improve the Honest Government ads and explore more complex issues such as this one and to produce this podcast. So if you're not a patron and you value what we do and want to help us continue doing it in 2021, head over to patreon.com forward slash the juice media and join those legends. Or if you want to support us in other ways, you can do so at thejuicemedia.com forward slash support. You've been listening to the Juice Media Podcast with me, Giordano. We'll be back in the new year with more genuine satire. Until then, from all of us here at the Juice Media, take care.